<laughs> it was the funniest. I'm watching the the playbacks, and I was like, <laughs> so this time I'm just like lock yeah. and load, okay. like just trying to I keep did. it. And I, I bet you I didn't. I bet you I was like, cam set, cam set. I like the acronyms. So, gosh, that that's a really fascinating background. Um, I want to unpack, if you'll indulge me, some of the nuggets, essentially, that you've planted here. You talked about ecosystems, and you said something really interesting to me, which was when you were referring to rainforest ecosystems, that that's where the carbon is. Now, that's obvious to most people, right? Because essentially, you know, high school biology, we, we learn about photosynthesis, et cetera. So it's a visible part of the sequestration potential, right, in terms of the, the, the forests. And like you said, the density is, is evident in space and in person. I want to unpack that that space and time piece as well. But what other ecosystems are also representative of as, as, as essentially carbon sinks? Because it's more broad than just terrestrial, alpine, and yeah. like like rainforests. Can you can you unpack that for me, please? In terms of just the largest potential, mm -hmm. I think oceans have it. Really? Right. Just because of the scale. Just 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 out of complete scale. Mm. But on the land, and I'm going to focus in on Southeast Asia because that's, that's, yep. that's where I'm working. And we're in Singapore. Uh, that's very, exactly. very... If I was to look from space, I would see forest first, right? Mm. tropical forests. That's the most apparent part, and that's something that people relate to the most. Yep. Uh, a lot of carbon there. But in terms of the density of carbon, it's what's beneath the forest. It's usually peat swamp or peat lands, right. uh, which are spread across... Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. they are, I mean, the, the largest ones and the intact ones are, for example, in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. um, they're in the Philippines. We are working in one of the sites there. Right. Uh, and the smaller ones across in Malaysia as well and other parts. But in terms of the, the density, peat swamps, they outcompete any other ecosystem. Wow. We, we're starting to better understand the, the carbon dynamics in mangrove because mangroves is above the ground it's mangrove but there's a lot locked in the soil as well of course but I, we still think peat swamp is a peat is number one in terms of density, terms of density. then probably mangrove and then these old growth tropical terrestrial forests okay in terms of spatial scale forests are the biggest the terrestrial forest okay the peat swamps are more Concentrated in some parts. Concentrated literally and figuratively. Exactly. Right? In terms of geography, yep. but also in terms of the density yep. as you mentioned. That's and interesting. Mangroves, then again, like this this Southeast Asia, because of the geography and the islands mm -hmm. and the extreme uh, coastline, sure. there's a lot of mangroves. Of course, and it's the surface area e equation. Exactly. Right. So uh, that's where the, 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 the carbon is. But in terms of time, right, we when we talk about carbon sequestration, if you if you if you pay attention, whenever you talk about locking carbon, if you're talking about 100 years, mm -hmm. that's usually, what a, project, usually yeah. what a project is, right? 100 years is nothing. It's a blink of an eye when you look oh, at you look a at peat swamp forest. Yeah, exactly. exactly. You, like uh, time scale, you, you cut a forest down. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll grow back in 20 years. If left. Physically, if left. it will look mm -hmm. like a forest again. Yep. Ecologically, it might not be. The animals are not there. Yeah, is it really a forest question. if there's no animals exactly. in there? Yep. Yeah. It's just a collection of trees, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the carbon might be there. And 20 years, okay, you give it another 50 years, you get birds coming in, mammals coming in, because, oh, this is a nice forest. In the words of old property builders, build it and they'll come. Right? Yeah. So if you have a restoration project, animals will find their way there. It'll right. become a you know, forest eventually. But peat swamps, the peat, Lands, they take thousands of years to really get to that quality again. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, it'll never be that quality that was before. So the time scale, a 100-year project, for restoration, it has to be more targeted towards your tropical forest and mangroves. Mm -hmm. But if you're talking about conservation and protection, the peat swamp and peatland forest are the ones you really want to preserve because the, the time it takes to get that carbon back is way long, much, much longer. That's fascinating. I, I love that. Time scale, they're, they're the parameters here that we're talking about, the density component, that's really interesting. What are some of the pressures that are, that are facing essentially the peatlands? Ooh, um, I think the biggest one is conversion to agriculture. Mm -hmm. I think- Are they fertile grounds for, for agriculture? Yeah, it's, the, the, the soil can be very acidic, mm -hmm. so it, it, it's actually not really good for agriculture, but it's uh, the social and the economic pressures Got it. force the conversion to happen. The, conversion. the same way in the mountains, the uh, slopey uh, 
land is not the best for agriculture because the, the nutrients leach out of with course. the rain. Yeah. But the social and political pressures make, you can't avoid doing cropping there. Of course. Uh, so agriculture will always be a competing factor for mm. any nature-based solution. Sure. It's, it's one of the oldest uh, you know, professions that we have. Uh, we depend on it. I don't think farmers get enough credit in the, the, our urban lifestyle. And in society in general. In society in and general. Eat every day. I always feel a bit sad when a farmer is usually the one that's poorest in a food chain of mm -hmm. a, a commodity, whereas we depend on them. So and that, we're industrializing that as well in, in, exactly. in the Western world, and, and that's got impacts. Yeah. With and the, uh, of the you know ecosystem. the the pressure on an ecosystem by uh, a small scale Asian farmer is very different from the pressures of a large scale industrialized Western farmer. Completely. The ones in terms of f f like fertilizer imports runoff, it, the, the scale, or the even, disruption, and even just the like, or even the 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 social and cultural attachment that the farmer sure. has with the. Sure. With the and you know what we often see in um, Southeast Asia or Asia for general is the farmland is usually very close to a forest, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that the link between the the two is very different, difficult to break. As an individual, as a farmer, you spend a lot of time in the farm, but you also spend a lot of time in the forest. Mm -hmm. You know, you have an ecosystem that has was once a forested ecosystem is now agricultural ecosystem. Yep, there's carbon there as well, mm. but then you're still attached to the forest and. I feel like in Southeast Asia, that dynamic is very, uh, it's, it's actually very fluid. Yeah. You have stuff that is forest becoming agricultural land, agricultural land going back into forest as well. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that ecosystem is definitely very dynamic. There's lots to unpack there. Yeah. And thank you for that, because it's, it's really elucidating in terms of having that perspective being provided, right, from someone in the field and looking at this um, as, as ecosystems, essentially. So identifying the density, the importance, the time scales are really important. Now, let's take a step back, literally, again, and, and look at it from a scale perspective. So your role is essentially quantifying the carbon, like intensity and value locked in those, those ecosystems. I would imagine for forests, let, let's begin with forests, that it's easier to do so than on the peatland side. Can you, take, can you walk us through the various different scales? Because my rudimentary understanding is we're looking at it from satellite, so effectively looking down. So now we've got the essentially the scale of the pixels that can actually be sort of analyzed, quantified, right? Yeah, quantified. Yeah. Thank you. And then the on the ground or as close to on the ground. So we may we may have drone, then lidar, and then effectively physical sampling of the forest. Is that yeah, an yeah. accurate description? So can you can you walk me down effectively step down from okay. from Satellites all the way down. I'll, I'll try and do the other way around. I'll do the other uh, way. Yeah, That's great. Uh, imagine you're standing in the forest mm -hmm. and you're looking up, right? The first thing you'll see is this giant tree that's covering it, right? Yeah. Just the fact that you have to first quantify the carbon in a single tree. It starts with a single tree single first. Single tree. Okay. Right? The way is the traditional method, which is um, just because it's traditional doesn't mean it's obsolete. It's sure. it's tried and tested. Yeah. Is you. You kind of assume that the tree is a cylinder. Mm -hmm. uh, you measure the diameter at breast height, dBH. Yep. And you kind of estimate the height, depending on what kind of instruments you have. Sure. And you have equations for converting that volume with the wood density into mm -hmm. biomass. Biomass. And then you convert it into carbon. Okay. That's the traditional way of doing it. Right? Mm -hmm. But now you're sampling different yeah, so, points so, in a map. Exactly. So, so what, you, what, you, what we do is when... Um, we set up a plot, which we think is representative of the larger ecosystem. Right. right. And then we measure the, the carbon in a single tree mm -hmm. and all the trees in a plot. So there's a bit of error already. Of course. Not only fact that you can never estimate the height or you know the, the shape of a tree completely. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's one time point as well. It's one time point. Then you're kind of averaging or summing up the, the amount of carbon in that one plot. And then maybe you have 10 other plots and then you're extrapolating it to the entire area. Because it's impossible physically to actually sample every single tree in a rainforest. Okay. Unless you could speak to ants and you could send out an army of ants and they'll collect the data for you, I think it's physically impossible. Oh man, you're planning a lot of, <laughs> lot of Easter eggs here, right? I've got, I've got a Doctor Strange vibe and then an Ant-Man vibe here. Yep, Cup yep. On oh, I, uh, <laughs> ultimate scientists. And then we're trying to do that at one spatial scale, which in some cases it's enough. Yeah. If you have a project that is maybe a few hectares or you know a couple of hundred hectares, mm -hmm. it's enough. 
Uh, it's efficient, the method. It's uh, both time and money-wise. But when you start going to thousands of hectares, you know, the size of a, a, a concession or a reservation mm -hmm. or a protected area. Or then, jurisdictional level. Exactly. Then those methods start, the, the error, that margin of error that is there in the way we calculate, mm. it's a, it gets a bit too much, right? Sure. So how do you scale it? How do you go from a plot to a protected area? is the way the satellite technology comes in. And I remember in CMI, someone had mentioned that, you know, what is the most neutral technology? I think it's space satellite technology. Um, we have sensors that are looking down mm -hmm. from the heavens every day yep. uh, on the International Space Station, on other uh, individual satellites, and they're capturing our world from a far away perspective. But what they're also doing is that they are collecting temporal data. The, you know, as the satellite goes over the same site again. Yep. You can give the time scale and time looking scale. at over exactly. time. Yeah. But when it's the oldest satellites that we've been using is NASA's Landsat mission. Mm -hmm. The problem is that it's it's taking a photograph from space. It's a two D image of a three D system, mm -hmm. right? And you can you can only estimate how much carbon is going to be that ecosystem by looking from the top. So what we try and do is we combine the 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 measurements on the ground mm -hmm. with imagery from the top and we build models to scale up the measurements. Great. There's error there. I, I don't deny it. There's always going to be an error. But satellite technology has come a long way to the point where you can act. There, 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 there's data available where we're mapping at a centimeter of, uh, or five centimeter level. Wow, that's a lot of granularity. Exactly. Uh, imagine having you know a pixel this size of the whole planet, of the forest, of the mangroves, of the peat swamp. Mm -hmm. Peat swamp's tricky because it's, you can't see it. You can't see it from no. the forest. But it's there. And at some point, it becomes an issue of data processing and not, mm -hmm. not the science itself. Not the science itself. So that's the scale we're working with. Fascinating. And then there is there are space lasers. Space lasers. Space lasers. Uh, there's NASA's JEDI mission. Again, now uh, you have a Star Wars reference as well. Okay, great. Which is literally <laughs> shooting a laser down on the planet awesome. to detect what is the height of the canopy and where the ground is. Oh, wow. And so this is a structural, like you've gone from a 2D image, which is a photograph, mm -hmm. to now a, like a point in 3D space. Like, oh, so this forest canopy is this high and millions of these footprints across the, the planet. The mission was supposed to go on for two years. It's gone past that now. Incendent. And I hope it stays for a while. So do I. That That's data awesome. is invaluable. I can imagine. Imagine you have a, you know, a snapshot from space of the densest part of the forest in Borneo, where it'll take you 10 days to get in. And yeah. now you have that data. You and, have that data. And you can better improve your estimates. So wow. that's the scale that we work with. That is a fascinating scale. Wow, lo lo lots, to, lots to unpack, literally. Great. I'm going to have a quick drink and then have a thought about how we go from there. Okay. Cheers. Cheers.